11 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 11 uh, is considered the most difficult chapter in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is considered the most difficult book in the New Testament. However, I would like to suggest to you that the book of Revelation is considered difficult because I don't believe it is approached very well, a very capable. In other words, there are two hermeneutical principles I gave you when we started this course. The first, of course, was that uh, the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. It is to teach us through symbols. If we are not sensitive to the fact that that's the methodology that the Holy Spirit is using in a very unique way, then uh, the book of Revelation cannot be understood. You can't understand Zechariah. You can't understand Daniel, at least parts of it. You can't understand Ezekiel and parts of Isaiah uh, and, and Joel and a few other books if you are simply some type of rigid literalist. Those books will never make sense to you. And that's true of the book of Revelation. So, when you understand that this is a picture book, a, a book of symbols, then you have a tool to make sense of the book of Revelation and chapter 11. And, and if you understand that this book in particular was written in, in the context of these things are to soon take place, then you have another tool of interpretation that will be very helpful to you. So, in the light of these tools, the book of Revelation opens up to a degree I think very few people can ever understand it. If you're a futurist, of course, you can say anything you want. You can let your imagination run wild, and there's nobody who can really catch you, chapter and verse, and say, ha-ha, you got that wrong. I mean, how does anybody know it's in the distant future whether you got it right or wrong? So all we know is that in 1988, the 88 reasons why Jesus was coming this year didn't happen, you say. We also know, interestingly, that uh, in uh, the Pentateuch, we're told that if a prophet prophesies and his prophecy doesn't come true, you're to stone him to death, not give him six million dollars which is exactly what's happening to the prophets who are prophesying that Jesus is coming and the Church of Jesus Christ is responding by making millionaires out of these false prophets. See, I'm particularly offended you haven't made a millionaire out of me. We're trying. <laughs> Not trying hard enough. <laughs> so, but there's a real issue there. Not just a joke. That, that what do you have? You have a, a, a bland disclaimer. Now, nobody really knows. And then 187 pages of, you know, I know, with some bland disclaimer that this may not take place. If that same prophet in the Old Testament had made these prophecies with this bland dis disclaimer, what good would that disclaimer do? I think it got himself stoned anyhow. See, it's, it's a phony disclaimer. That's what I'm trying to say. And they, these guys are false prophets. So, I think you approach the book of Revelation that way. There's no way of understanding. Let's see if we can understand it uh, using the principles that we have used uh, through the book so far. Then I was given a measuring rod, like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there who do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Okay, let's begin by taking note of the fact that when a uh, something is measured, it generally has a very positive connotation to it. And here we have certain things measured, certain things are not measured. First of all, we can just start with Zechariah 1.16 to lay the foundation. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, 
I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Here is a promise by God. He said, dispersed Israel into Babylon. He says, now I've returned to Jerusalem. Let's get out the building tools, the measuring line, you see, and let's start measuring out this city and getting it rebuilt. It's a, it's a positive, good thing, is what I'm trying to say. And we find that actually in several places. In fact, we find it later in the book of Revelation with a, uh, a staff and a measuring rod. What is being measured? Rise and measure the temple and the altar. Now, the altar is right outside the, the temple, if you remember. And those who worship there. Uh, those who gather around the uh, altar with their burnt sacrifice. Uh, so we got these three entities mentioned. Now this would represent, of course, the, the holiest of the community. Uh, those who take worship seriously, those who go to the temple, those who offer sacrifice. That's the symbol here of the most holy uh, of the community. But do not measure the court outside of the temple. Now the court outside of the temple, there were several courts, two uh, in particular. There was the court of the women, where they could go to the door, so to speak, and view the altar, but they couldn't go beyond that. And then there was the court of the Gentiles. They could not enter the court of the women because they were Gentiles, and that was, uh, they were not allowed to go there. And the court of the Gentiles was huge. Uh, I don't know how many acres right off, and I don't, you know, I suppose I should uh, look this up, but there was many, many acres of land in this court of the Gentiles. It would hold a multitude of people. And, uh, of course, then the rest of the city. But the point of, uh, of being made by the author, a certain segment is going to be preserved. And on the other segment... Uh, the court outside the temple, he says, leave that out. <clears throat> now, I'd like to draw your attention to that phrase, leave that out. That seems uh, like a, sort of an innocuous phrase with no particular significance. The significance is really found in the, uh, in the word, Greek word, ekbalo, which means to cast out. Uh, and it's translated leave out in, in this case. But I, I think cast out would have been a, a better translation. And let's take a look at where this word is used a couple other places in John chapter 9. This is the story of the uh, man born blind who Christ healed. And then the Pharisees, you know, the Sadducees and such like were infuriated because of this man being uh, blind. You can see their compassion. Uh, and in verse 22, uh, his parents being questioned by the authorities, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already, already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue, cast out, same word, cast out of the synagogue. Now, what New Testament word do we normally use in referencing this idea of cast out of the synagogue? Excommunication. Excommunication is the word we would uh, use. And so what I'm trying to say here is in the book of Revelation, he's saying leave out, do not measure the court outside the temple, uh, uh, leave that out, uh, cast that out. That is, Judaism, think with me, Judaism is being excommunicated is being put out of the community of faith. A certain segment, we read about the 144,000, a certain segment of faithful Judaism is preserved, a small segment, but the great mass of Judaism is now being excommunicated. Jerusalem is being excommunicated. That's important. For it is given over to the nations. Uh, also, look with me at Luke 21, 24. This is Luke's version of the uh, Olivet Discourse. Let 
Remember the elephant discourse, Matthew 24. This is Luke's version. Uh, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Does that sound familiar with what we just read here in Revelation, where it talks about... Uh, for it is given over to the nations, that is Gentiles, they will trample under, uh, they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So the terminology, trample underfoot by the Gentiles, is virtually identical in these two passages. This is another il illustration of the fact that the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation are discussing the same things. I said this over and over and over to you, and you have seen indication of that over and over and over, have you not? This is one more illustration of the fact that these two books are saying much of the same thing. Of course, the, uh, of the discourse is the, is the short version, and so we don't get as much data. But periodically, as we're studying the longer book, we're pulling a phrase, a concept, out of that out of a discourse as we move forward because it is the same story fleshed out in more detail. Is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, you 42 months. If you figure out the months and divide them, what do you get? Three and a half, three three and and a half years. years. We've been familiar with the fact that there is a three and a half year period, not a seven year period, which we are led falsely to believe, but a three and a half year period that is uh, going on and the uh, uh, destruction of Jerusalem. As, uh, uh, as the armies of Rome have been called in to uh, destroy this uh, community, uh, it turns out, uh, and then we have no way to know when it started, which was uh, uh, February AD 67. That's when uh, Nero issued his order. And the temple and the city are, are destroyed and burned by August, AD 70. Want to guess how many months that is? 42. 42 months. How about that? 42 months. Now, Nero didn't say, hey, I want you to attack this city in 42 months. Exactly, I want you to destroy it. John wrote this before all this took place. If he didn't, I, my contention is John was a fraud. And since I don't accept the possibility of the scripture being fraudulent, therefore John had to write this before these events took place. And I figure he wrote it somewhere 62, 64 A.D. And, and, and in time, of course, it was fulfilled. Uh, just as he had written it. And so this community is to be trodden underfoot for 42 months. Any questions about this so far? I would draw your attention to the fact that it says they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, if you're thinking carefully, and I want you to think carefully and deeply, uh, what are one thing you will notice about that phrase I just read? They want to trample the holy city for 42 months. They trample the holy city for, you know, 42 days, maybe. You say, you know, in other words, the last part of this three and a half year period, prior to that, they couldn't get in and trample anything. They were besieging it. You, you're tracking with me? So the question is, ah, you know, John almost got it right. You know, is that is that what it comes down to? I mean, uh, when you you see these, and you need to see these things because take my word for it, somebody who doesn't read the Bible is going to see them. You follow me? And they're going to throw them in your face. It says they, it says they trampled the city for 42 uh, months. They didn't even trample it for 42 days. That might be their response. Uh, or maybe they did for 42 days. But see, it, did, it really didn't come true. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of that city in New York called uh, Synecdoche? Is that how you pronounce it? Synecdoche. I noticed when I was looking up a, a literary term this week that it's pronounced, uh, and, and I 
really didn't bring my copy. I can pronounce it in Greek perfectly. I cannot pronounce it in English. I have to look at the Greek letters to pronounce it. Uh, that is pronounced the same way as this city in New York. Anybody familiar with uh, uh, you know this grammatical concept of uh, schenectomy? You know, uh, metonymy is another element in grammar that addresses initial. Everybody heard of metonymy? Okay, well, they are important concepts. We use them all the time, and that's using a part for the whole or a whole for the part as we speak. Um, and uh, the, when, when somebody uh, uh, wants to say that uh, you know, Jerusalem was destroyed, Israel was destroyed, they will take a part and say, uh, you know, Jerusalem is, is destroyed. And it wasn't really, it's the, you know, the whole thing. When people said in 1999, I New York was attacked, but in, in reality, it was America was attacked, right? Or if they reverse it, and grammatically you reverse it, America was attacked. In fact, nowhere in America was attacked except a small place in Manhattan. Would you say you're wrong, America wasn't attacked, only Manhattan was attacked? No, you wouldn't, because we, under, we, we speak this way. This is normal language, you see. And my point is the Bible was written in normal language. It's the way people spoke then and now, and uh, they used, uh, you know, grammatical substitutes. So when it speaks of Jerusalem being tread down uh, 42 months, that is a, uh, a normal way of speaking, meaning uh, Jerusalem, and all that it represented, the land of Israel, it was under attack and tread down for 42 months. Does that make sense to you? Are you content with that? Now, if you are a literalist to the point you can't grasp even English grammar and cannot be taught and, and cannot... You know, look these things up and, uh, and have any, I don't know, any uh, rational flexibility in the use of language, then you're going to be confused and unhappy. Confused because you can't understand it, and unhappy because you're frightened that maybe Scripture failed. Now, scripture doesn't fail. This is what failed. It's your inability to uh, understand language. That's all it, that's all it boils down to. And so it's common everyday language uh, that's being used here in the common everyday way that we continue to use it 2,000 years later. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Given over to the nation, they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, any question what the holy city is? Uh, there's only one holy city, you'd say, to a Jew. That would be Jerusalem. He wouldn't be talking about Rome or New, or New York City or places that doesn't even exist yet. Charleston. What's that? Or Charleston, South Carolina. They call this the Holy City. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it can only be Jerusalem that's under discussion. We're going to learn more about Jerusalem in a few minutes. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. Now that's where it gets interesting. Uh, what we've covered so far in the first verse there, you know, that's, that makes sense. You know, okay. Um, we see it in Luke. We understand that there's going to be an attack. It's 42 months long. Jerusalem's going to, and Israel will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And there's going to be a preservation of a righteous element. We even read about that in chapter 7, uh, the 144,000. You're, you're tracking with me so far. You have any issues so far? If you do, uh, share those with me. And we will address them because uh, we want to. Any questions of any kind? Any observations? Anybody want to put in two cents? <laughs> okay. Uh, why two witnesses? Why not three? Why not one? Why not 15? We have two witnesses, and witnesses do what? They witness, you say. What are they going to witness? Well, we're going to find out in a minute. And, uh, and when we talk about witness, what, what are we talking about? I was on the beach, and I witnessed a boat go by. Is that, you know, does it have any more significance than that? This is what I'm trying to say is a legal term. We have two uh, uh, forensic witnesses that are being discussed. This whole book is a legal book. This whole book is a certificate of divorce. God divorcing Judah as he had earlier Israel and marrying another, the bride of Christ. They say, 
A lot of people get uncomfortable about that. You know, we know God hates divorce. Well, yeah, he does. And uh, no question about it. But divorce for uh, harlotry, <coughs> I mean, that is a grounds for divorce in the Bible. Right? It's one of the few grounds for divorce. <coughs> so, there were two sisters who were harlots, we read in the Old Testament. One was Israel and the other is Judah. And eventually they have been both uh, divorced. But we got to have some witnesses to their harlotry, so to speak. Look with me in Deuteronomy 17, 6. 6. On the evidence of two witnesses, or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. The person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. So there's why we don't have one witness. Because God is in the present and uh, uh, is presently here, putting to death Israel, right? And say it takes what it takes two witnesses or three. What's the difference between two or three? Well, if you're not sure about one of them, you get a little extra witness. We're not going to have any questions about these two, so we don't need a third. You see, these are the uh, these witnesses have the highest qualification for being witnesses. Not demanding a third. Okay? You can't put somebody to death scripturally without uh, quality witnesses of their crime. And they will prophesy, these witnesses, for 1260 days, close the sackcloth. Okay, anybody want to guess how long 1260 days is? 42 months. And three and a half years. <laughs> yes, that's exactly. They have a mission to witness something, to observe, to watch, to prophesy, uh, and uh, this period is three and a half years. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew 18, verse 16. This is a uh, passage on church, this one really. But if he does not listen, take one or two other, other what? Other witnesses, along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I wonder where he's pulling that from. That's the exact words out of Deuteronomy, isn't it? Two or three witnesses. So, the concept of, of, uh, of proper witness in a court setting. Remember, this is a church court. A lot of people don't understand especially if you come out of Baptist backgrounds or non-Presbyterian backgrounds, that the session, that, uh, and that in a, a word in itself doesn't make a lot of sense in certain denominations, session simply meaning with a board of trustees or a board of deacons or something like that. The session, the presbytery, session gives account to the presbytery, the general assembly, presbyteries give account to the general assembly, these are called courts. They adjudicate. So if you ever get a note from the session that says, you know, Bob, would you come and visit with us next week? <laughs> you know, here's what you should be thinking. Oh, my word, what have I done now? <laughs> because they have the power and authority to adjudicate in your life. And as you walk through the door to visit with them, you notice two friends of yours show up, <laughs> uh, two witnesses. Then you know you've been caught. <laughs> you've got to give an account. Okay, so that's what we have here. We have a court. We have witnesses. And uh, this is traditional uh, New Testament, Old Testament theology. It makes so much more sense to derive our meanings in the book of Revelation from the New Testament, Old Testament theology, than to have some goofball opinion of two people in the distant future who are going to do weird things. You say, uh, weird things meaning these things taken in a wooden, literal sense. And that makes them weird. You know, like literally breathing out fire with your mouth and killing people. That's going to, we're going to cover that in a minute. I said, no, that's Weird. <laughs> you say, there is no incident of that in the Bible. There are things close to it, however, that shed light on it. Any questions as we go so far uh, through this? Are you trying?
tracking with me. Is this so-called hard passage unfolding? And maybe, you know, why does he say this was hard? It's not so hard. Right there in the Bible, all these symbols. You see? Uh, that's what I want you to get. He identifies these two witnesses in a little bit more detail. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Well, with that in mind, let us take a look at Zechariah 4 3. And there are two olive trees by you, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. The bowl collects oil to run the lamps, and it collects olive oil. So the symbol is olive tree, which by definition would have lots of oil, <laughs> you see, for these lamps. Uh, he goes on to identify these olive trees and these lamps. You know, I, I cannot read the whole passage for you. You're going to have to read it yourself. But he identifies them as uh, uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua. I, I'm not mistaken. One is the high priest and one is the governor of that community. What he's identified is two lamps that are going to provide light to the community. It's going to be the church. We could call it that. And it's going to be a godly government. And these two lamps are being fed by the olive uh, uh, trays, which perhaps we can say the uh, power of God and the Holy Spirit. And they're going to shed light in this community. God's life to affect his type of community as they rebuild uh, Jerusalem in these days right after the captivity. Is that making sense? John is, is taking that information and says, I'm going to give you what's going on here. He says, we got two witnesses. And let me tell you who those witnesses are or what they are. They are uh, the law and the prophets. Now, uh, that's a little bit mm, not clear yet. I mean, we have two individuals, uh, a religious individual and a political individual, who are God's chosen instruments to uh, this community. Uh, but John's going to flesh it out and make it clear. And he starts in verse 5. If anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Okay. Now I just talked about fire pouring out of the mouth and how that's questionable if, if we should consider something like that literal. But if we go down to uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 10, we'll get some insight. Here we have uh, Elijah. Uh, the enemy of uh, the king. The king sends an uh, army, or, or a few men, a company of men, to arrest him. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 men with his 50. And he went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill. And he said, O man of God, the king says, come down. And Elijah answered the captain of 50, I am a man of God. Let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Okay. They come out of his mouth. They called fire down from heaven and destroyed uh, his enemies. This went on a couple, three times. Finally, about the fourth time, I think it was, that guy got the message. Now, the captain of fifty and his fifty, he approached on his hands and knees begging <laughs> for mercy. You know. You know, especially as he kept, as he got closer and closer, the grass got crisper and crisper. And he, <laughs> you know, oh my. <laughs> so he got down and begged for mercy. And uh, God showed him mercy because he was humble. Uh, so we have a picture of death from fire. Uh, but it says it comes out of his mouth. So that uh, would cause us maybe to take a look at something like Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 14. And therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God, uh, the God of hosts. 
Because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth a fire. And this people would. And the fire shall consume them. Here we have a man, Jeremiah, is called to preach. And speaking of hellfire and brimstone sermons, <laughs> apparently he preached them. And uh, he says, not only am I putting fire in your mouth, my word, I'm going to turn this people into wood. And you know what wood does in the presence of fire. You, your message, you know, I mean, Jeremiah wasn't killing anybody, but your message of prophecy and doom, which produces death and slavery, will indeed produce death and slavery. These people will be consumed uh, because the, of the prophetic message. They will be destroyed. So, uh, what do we have here so far? We have two prophets, Jeremiah and Elijah. They are used as illustrations, and their behavior is used as illustrations to drive a point. I have a, two prophets, and prophets prophesy. They're going to speak. And guess what their words are going to, are going to be about? They're going to be about judgment. They're going to be about death. I'm going to empower them in their message, and this community, like the community of Jeremiah's day, is going to be destroyed uh, through that message. Uh, then <clears throat> that's one of the two witnesses, the prophetic witness. Uh, one of the olive trees, the, uh, the priest, the head of the religious community. And he goes on to say, They have power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Uh, you're familiar with that? incident in 1 Kings 17, 1. See, the thing about it is, when you're, and you're deeply uh, interested in what uh, the scripture has to say, you find yourself in the scripture. You can't just read it, let your imagination go wild. You have to use your cross-references and your knowledge of symbolism, too. Uh, about fire from a mouth and such like. That passes in Jeremiah with perfect illustration, I think, of what was going on there. Now, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and uh, Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Uh, I'm sure that had no impact whatsoever on Ahab, yet he was right. And but through, you know, several years later, it was right. He was right about that. It changed these ten. But what's the point here? What is John trying to do when he mentions, he keeps mentioning these, these prophets and their behaviors? Uh, he's identifying them with the two witnesses. He's saying one of these witnesses is the prophetic guilt, so to speak, the prophetic tradition. In Israel. And what's the other one? And it goes on to say, that they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. We don't even have to look up the verses there, do we? Who had the power to turn water into plague and to strike the uh, nation of uh, uh, water and blood, strike the nation with plagues? Moses, you know. Uh, that characterized his ministry, so to speak, in Israel, uh, excuse me, in Egypt at that time. And it's one of the great uh, uh, incidents, so to speak, in the history of Israel that they never ceased to talk about was Moses and taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. So we have another uh, prophet here, uh, or person prophesying. One is identified with the uh, prophetic guilt, and the other identified with the lawgiver of Israel. Is that clear to you? You want to take uh, exception to that? You want more discussion on that? Um, I'm, I'm at your disposal here. You said the prophetic what? Guilt. Guilt? Guilt. You know, like uh, college. Like, uh, remember Elijah? Uh, and Elijah 
Remember the College of the Prophets? What are they called? Different translations in the Bible. Um, they went and built barracks or uh, dormitories on one occasion for the prophets. They had a, uh, a, a, you know, a guild like a union. They had like a college or a union or a group, whatever word you want to use, of prophets in Israel, in which Elijah was uh, the head prophet. You know. And the point is, there's a tradition here, what I'm trying to state, uh, a prophetic tradition, and there's a legal tradition, uh, and no better representative of that is the lawgiver himself, Moses. These are the two prophets. How well do they correspond to the two lampstands in Zechariah, the priest and the governor? The governor, if you think in terms of law, the priest in terms of the prophetic message from God. You say, these are the two people who are the witnesses to this uh, trial, in this trial. Am I making sense? It's important I try to make sense, you know. Some people may not get the message, it's symbolic language. <coughs> and when they have finished their testimony, so that they, they, they observe, they bear testimony, and uh, they are identified with the law and the prophets, these are the two great <coughs> witnesses, not only at this period of time, but any period of time in the community of faith. You have the proclaimed word, of, like the pastor, prophecy, and you have the law of God, the law word of God, to which we submit ourselves to, uh, in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament. I mean, that, that never changes. Uh, Old or New Testament. But these two representatives of the law and the prophets bear witness. And, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Okay. The beast would be Satan because, you know, there's several beasts in the book of Revelation, but when it says he rose from the bottomless pit, that cuts down our options quite a bit as to which beast is under discussion. Satan makes war. Now, Satan doesn't make war directly any more than Jesus makes war directly. The, the armies of Rome were God's armies making war in Jerusalem, you see. And uh, so the point of that is Satan has his representatives uh, to uh, do what he wants done. What does he want done? He wants the law and the prophets silenced. Satan hates the law of God. He hates the prophetic word. He wants them destroyed. And so he uh, instigates in the, in, the, in the once, uh, that community that once was the community of faith, he instigates to have uh, the testimony of God destroyed. Uh, to make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom uh, and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. Uh, let's go through a few verses. Uh, Matthew 23, 35. And we read, Jesus speaking, so that on you, he says to his audience, may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Bacariah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Question. Was it the habit of the Jews to kill their prophets? It was the habit. And did Jesus say upon this generation, we're going to have an accounting? Yes, he did. We just read it. He said that they would be responsible, all the blood. All the blood. From, all, based on Abel. From yeah. All the time. Yeah. These were the successor representatives. As Adam represented the human race in that, going in that reverse, they represented the human race, the community of believers, moving in this direction. The, uh, those who had murdered uh, Cain, uh, having killed Abel, all the way to, the, to, to this point right here. <clears throat> and there was one more prophet they hadn't yet killed. Who was that? Jesus. Jesus Christ. 
crime. Uh, and uh, it wasn't very long after this prophecy. They put him to death. They did their best to silence the prophetic word in Israel. It must die because they hated the prophetic word of God. And they hated the law word of God. The lawgiver and the great prophet, Jesus Christ, was put to death. Ralph, you could see how Satan enters into that just through um, Jews' Iscariot. Because it actually says, Satan, and Satan entered into him, and then he betrayed Christ. Satan entered into Judas. It says here that the beast from the bottomless pit does this thing. That's your point. Okay. I thought that was. I wanted to make sure. <laughs> and so you see Satan uh, uh, murdering these witnesses. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 14. But in the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. That's God speaking to Jerusalem. Now this is important for you to recognize, of course, because some people have a hard time, I don't know why, have a hard time figuring out which city is under discussion here. You know, they did their best to make Rome out of it. The holy city, well the Pope would like that, but that's just not the case. The holy city, which was mentioned a few verses earlier, Jerusalem, and the great city, and Jerusalem is called great city in the Bible, and then secular uh, uh, Josephus, I think, uses that term, that symbolically is called Sodom. We just saw that it did, and that's not the only place in the Old Testament that's called Sodom, I might add. And Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. Is that a giveaway? <laughs> where our Lord was crucified? Crucified. How much more information you need? And I've heard people read, covering this passage, say, now that doesn't mean Jerusalem. I, I swear I've read it. <laughs> Where people just can't seem to get the message that this book is talking about Jerusalem. Notwithstanding how clear it is. At least to me, I hope it's clear to you. <clears throat> this city, which was the apple of God's eye, at one time, is now identified with Sodom and Gomorrah and with Egypt. Could you pick two more ugly cities in all the ancient world or communities if you were looking to make a symbolic point? <clears throat> Sodom, where we get our term sodomy, is one choice of an ugly community that he wants to identify with Jerusalem. And we talked earlier about the possible sodomy that was going on in Jerusalem at this time. Then he picks another city, uh, community, that community in which they were in bondage and, and, and God freedom. And in essence, you have become the enemy. At one time Egypt was the enemy, you're now the enemy. You're the Sodom I destroyed. You're the Egypt that I uh, brought all these judgments upon. You, we have found the enemy, and it is us. <laughs> We're the enemy. Jerusalem's the enemy. And so that's the testimony that, these, that the uh, law and the prophets are bearing. They've identified those who have destroyed the law of God uh, the, the, the prophets of God, uh, historically in the martyrdoms, and in the person of Jesus Christ, par excellence. They're bearing witness that this community is the great enemy of God on the face of the earth. Now, to those that have this uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. Some people cannot accept the fact that a Jew can do anything wrong. A 
and this is the most uh, you know, outrageous terminology, symbolism. Biological descent from Adam, uh, excuse me, from Abraham means nothing, as Christ and Paul points out. You don't have an in like flint because you're a rigid, as it's Paul uh, makes the point over and over again in how God shows uh, Jacob, not, uh, not Esau, the firstborn, and other similar acts of choice, as we heard earlier this morning. Um, we have a community here that was chosen and now is being unchosen because of their sin. They're being cast off. A divorce is taking place. The harlot is being put to death for her sin. Two witnesses, bearing witness of this crime. <clears throat> And for three and a half days, some of the people, uh, some from the people and tribes and languages and nations will gaze on their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tent. <clears throat> now, a question, there are a couple questions here. One, we've got uh, peoples, tribes, languages, and nations. What's the issue? What's the problem? If I'm having a problem here, what's my problem? I'm having a problem here. What's my problem? <laughs> As I study this. We're talking about Judaism doing these great evil things. And now we're talking about uh, the whole spectrum, apparently, of the world. So, you know, tribe, languages, and nations. Do you, you see the, my, my issue? need to share that with you. Somebody else will point it out to you if I don't, and you'll be stumped. Don't want you to be stumped. Uh, if you uh, would, turn to me, uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 8. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pyrogera, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians uh, and Ara Arabians. Okay, what do we have here in Jerusalem at the time of uh, Pentecost? We have a great religious feast. Pentecost. And what does a great religious feast tend to do? It draws crowds of worshipers from not only around Israel, and read the list, all over the Mediterranean. Jews, proselytes of various kinds have come to Jerusalem, and, and they get caught up in this um, revival. Do you see that? Okay, here's my point. A little bit of historical information. Unfortunately, it slipped my mind as to which piece. But when Rome... Uh, was attacking uh, Jerusalem, they did so providentially at a time in which there was a great feast going on in Jerusalem. Like Pentecost. I think you mentioned that in that quote by Josephus. Yeah. And so what we have here is a town of, of about uh, 200,000. And, and that this was common. Their population would swell to over a million people during these special feasts, you say. And just at that time when it had swelled, Titus puts his army around and seals it off <laughs> in the providence of God. Thought you'd get you away, huh? We have a town here now of over a million people. All of these countries, all of these languages, all of, some Jews, some proselytes, some Merchants come to sell their goods. Who knows who's there? There is a great crowd there in Jerusalem that would fit, I think, the criteria of uh, people's tribes, languages, and nations who were to observe the behavior 
and I don't mean two bodies laying in the street. These are symbols of the law and the prophets being violated, you know, priests being murdered, uh, legal authorities being murdered. If you read Josephus, you see there was a civil war in which this was going on uh, by the tune of tens of thousands. They were praying each other, attacking each other, killing priests, uh, kill, uh, killing political leaders. The law of the prophets, symbolically in the purity of that in Christ's own person, and in the symbols that uh, office holders, who may, uh, may not be particularly good people, but they have a certain uh, prestige and authority because of the office they hold. Like you're told in the service, you know, you don't salute the person who may be second rate, but you salute the rank. You know, they hold an office, they hold a position that gives them uh, respect. And so there were priests, and there were lawgivers, so to speak, uh, in Jerusalem at this time, and they were all experiencing uh, mass insurrection. Well, you make Civil the, war. The three and a half days then. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm <laughs> getting ready to. Uh, what, what do you notice about three and a half? Commonly used in the book of Revelation. But what is three and a half? It's a half of a seven. And what is, what we're saying here, I think, we don't have the complete and utter destruction of the law and the prophets. I mean, they're not gone forever. We have an attempt to destroy them. And that's what the three and a half represents. A half, you know, uh, it's not necessarily a halfway effort, but it's a halfway result. An apparent destruction. Are you tracking with me with the idea? The three and a half, seven being the complete and su successful thing, and three and a half is you, you didn't really pull it off. You see? A half, you were only halfway successful. Right, Tom? Right. Oh, okay. It was too cold in here. Now it's too warm in here. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, and so I think the three and a half. Yeah, is symbolic of the fact that their efforts to destroy the law and the prophets fail. And I don't think it's a mistake that it has some reference to Jesus Christ conquering death also in three, three and a half days, whatever you, you know, the symbolic fact that they buried the God's law and God's prophets, so to speak. They put them to death. But the grave can't hold that which God enlightens and gives life to Jesus Christ and his law and his prophets continue. They are resurrected and they continue in the church of Jesus Christ. They may be dead in Israel. I'm going to take that back. They are dead in Israel and have been for 2,000 years, but they live in the church. They're resurrected to live in the church. Now there's some bad news here for the church. At least for a part of the church. What part am I Dressing here. They might consider this bad news. You have the law being resurrected, and we know we're not under law, we're under grace. So there is that antinomian, this means against the law, element in Christianity. They even write books about how if you somehow or another <coughs> sin, grace may abound. I know that comes right out of scripture, but it still it comes out of dispensationalism text. My point is, God did raise the law and the we don't only, we not only have prophetic uh, men, pastors and such like evangelists, who proclaim the word of God in the church of Jesus Christ, but we have a law word that we're expected to uh, live by. And when <clears throat> Uh, somebody discusses something with you about, thus saith the Lord, your response isn't to be, but I've always thought. <laughs> like, who cares what you've always thought? I just told you what the Bible said. There is a disrespect by Christians of the Word of God. 
They always want to give you your opinion when you tell them what the Bible says. As if I care what your opinion is. I care what the opinion of the Holy Spirit is. That's the authority of the law, word of God, which was resurrected for our life. So I think the three and a half is the attempt to destroy the law and the prophets was unsuccessful. It was half of a whole, half of a true successful end. And, uh, and God empowered his law and his prophets to rise in the church. And, uh, of course, to refuse to, uh, to let them be placed in tombs, it shows the utter contempt of those who are murdering. And that, I might add, is what's happened in Jerusalem. Uh, they, in the first few, year, first few weeks or whatever, they buried people. After a while, they were too many people to bury. What they tried to do was throw them over the wall. I mean, they, you know, Titus, you know, Cephas records, riding around the city, see the mountains of body. They say, he, uh, so Cephas said, he just groaned at what the Jews were doing to themselves. Unburied, rotted corpses and mountains being thrown over. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people dying. But he didn't groan enough that when they actually did escape, he actually captured them and crucified them facing Jerusalem. as a big um, circle of crosses of crucified people trying to escape. I mean, what did Christ say? Something to the effect that there's been nothing like this and nor ever will be anything like this again? And the uh, Holy Discourse, remember that? On the inside, they were praying on each other like, you know, you can't believe. On the outside, of course, the Romans were doing the same thing to us. It was the most hideous of experiences, to say the least. And I might add, as uh, uh, <coughs> Deuteronomy uh, states, that, you know, the judgments of God upon Israel will be, they'll eat their own children. That happened in Jerusalem during this time. They were cooking and eating their babies. So, so that can't happen. Well, you wouldn't think so, but Josephus recorded that it did happen. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Does the word of God torment? Unsaved. It does so. And so every effort was made to murder them. And there was a great party going on inside Jerusalem by the, 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 the three gangs that were controlling the city. And they would make a raid on one part of the city and destroy it and come back and party. And they were destroying. Uh, smiting, hip and thigh, so to speak, joint and mark, <coughs> the uh, substance of, of, of um, orthodox Judaism, and rejoicing in it, as they did so. Now, there was parting on the outside of the walls, too, I'm sure, especially after the collapse. We know there was. We know the Romans planted their uh, idolatrous uh, divisional, legionary symbols in the temple and then sacrifice pigs and other such animals to their gods right in the temple that they had just burned up and destroyed. Horrible thing, and they were excited and partying about it. Horrible things were going on. But there was partying going on too. And primarily because the evil of, uh, of faith was destroyed. And these people wanted it destroyed. <clears throat> but after three and a half days, where the breath of life entered them, they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on all those who saw them. Uh, word of God, man of God, prophets of God, law of God brings fear on those that hate God. Then they <clears throat> heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven into a cloud. And their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake. 
and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, Josephus <clears throat> tells us. Uh, well, I do is find it. Okay, reading from Josephus again, and I'm only going to read a part of it. Because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm have a shortage of time. This also appeared to the vulgar to be a happy prodigy, as if God did thereby open them the gates of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of the holy house was dissolved of its own accord. This is one day when multi-ton gates opened by themselves. It took 20 men to close those gates. <laughs> and they opened by themselves. And the learned men said, uh-oh, the security of God has been removed. He's saying. <clears throat> and that the gate was opened for the advantage of their enemies. So these publicly declared that the single foreshadowed the dissolution that was coming upon them. Besides these, a few days after that feast, on the one and the twentieth day of the month of uh, Artemisis, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running among the clouds and surrounding the cities. Bad enough, the Romans were doing that. Moreover, at that feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were uh, going, but there's the feast I was wondering about. As the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking. We just talked about a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, so we, talk, we just heard about thunders, great noises. And after that, a sound as of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. As they ministered into the temple. And what did we just read? Come up here. That's just another way of saying, let us remove hence. There was a removal of the ministry of the priests and the prophets out of the temple. God abandoned that temple. And that's the come up here or what Josephus tells us, this voice that the priests heard. I bet it scared them pretty good. God abandoned his place. He no longer would defend it. And, uh, and then, of course, ultimately, there was the destruction of the city that soon followed it. This is a highly symbolic section. That's why it makes it hard. Because you're just constantly reaching into the scripture for the various symbolic hints. Almost every other phrase or every phrase suggests to you pulling them together, pulling them together, pulling them together to make sense of the story. But I think it does make sense of the story if you take the time to pull the symbolism together from the New and Old Testament. And that you see this is a story of the death of the Law of the Prophets and its resurrection and its, uh, uh, not only resurrection, but uh, ascendancy into heaven. And what do we read it? Just a few verses later, verse 19, then God's temple in heaven was opened, and what do we see there? And the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. Wait a minute. It was destroyed. But see, it was all transported. At least the earthly counterpart may have been destroyed, but it was the original was in, was in heaven. The temple of God, the ark of God, the worship of God continues, protected by God, notwithstanding what happened on this earth. I didn't even think about preparing for this whole chapter, just this much, because I know so much detail. And we'll get the rest of
rest of the chapter next week. And I, I, do, I wonder if I've conveyed the symbolism adequately to you, or do you feel I'm just patching the verses up to try to get over something difficult, and I really don't have an idea. That's only partially true.